SWSC aircraft should have a specific routine pre-flight inspection checklist, but the following can be used as an example and guideline. Wing Inspection Start with the nose. Inspect the nose plates and the attachment to the leading edges and keel. Ensure the nose plates are not cracked and the bolts are fastened securely. Check the wire attachments, top and bottom. Inspect the control frame, down tubes, and control bar for dents and ensure they are straight. Inspect the control frame attachment to the keel. Inspect the control bar to down tube brackets and bolts. Figure 5, 43. Inspect fore and aft flying wire condition, attachment to the keel, and the lower control bar corner brackets. Inspect the left side flying wire attachment to the control bar bracket and condition of the flying wire up to the wing attachment. Examine the flying wire attachment to the leading edge and crossbar, as well as all hardware at this crossbar and leading edge junction. Figure 5, 44. Inspect the condition of the crossbar and the leading edge from the nose to the tip. Any discrepancies or tears in the leading edge fabric must lead to more detailed investigation of the leading edge spar itself. Inspect the tip area, including the washout strut and general condition of the tip. If it is a double surface wing, look inside the tip and examine the inside of the wing and its components. Figure 5, 45. From the tip, inspect the surface condition of the fabric. Generally, if the fabric has not been exposed to sunlight for long periods and stored properly, the wing fabric should stay in good shape. Move along the trailing edge of the wing, inspecting the condition of the trailing edge and the tip batten attachments back to the keel. Figure 5, 46. Inspect the sail material, top and bottom, on the wing. Note that the trailing edge is vulnerable to rocks flying up from the wheels and hitting the propeller. End of page 5 to 17. Therefore, it is especially important to inspect the trailing edge in detail before each flight. At the aft keel area in the middle of wing, inspect the king post and all the condition of the wires from the king post to ensure they are not wrapped around the trailing edge battens. Figure 5, 47. Inspect the wing tensioning hardware where the crossbar tensioning cables attach to the rear of the keel. Repeat the same sequence for the right, or opposite, side of the wing, in the reverse order. Inspect the condition of the wing attachment to the carriage, including the backup cable. Figure 5, 48. Carriage Inspection. Inspect the mast from the top to the bottom and the carriage keel from the back to the front. Figure 5, 49. Check the front tube attachment and top and bottom security attachments. Check the seat security and seat attachments from the keel to the mast. Check the front nose wheel for proper play, tire inflation, and secure axle bolt. Test the ground steering bar and ensure there is smooth steering range of motion. Check the front shocks, if installed, the brakes for rust and corrosion, loose nuts slash bolts, alignment, cracks, signs of hydraulic fluid leakage, and hydraulic line security and abrasion, if so equipped. Figure 5, 50. Check the foot throttle for smooth operation and assure the parking brake is secured. Inspect the main landing gear drag struts, attachment to the keel, and attachment to the rear wheels. Examine the rear tires for proper inflation and tread plus the wheel attachment nut for security. End of page 5 to 18. Check main landing gear strut, landing gear shock absorber strut, and shock absorber operation. Figure 5, 51. Inspect all landing gear strut attachments to the airframe. Inspect the other side's rear landing gear by repeating the above procedure in reverse. Check all cowling for secure attachment and cracks. Figure 5, 52. Power Plant Inspection. Inspect engine attachment to the carriage for security and cracks. In addition to looking at the bolts and mounts, shake the propeller, as shown in Figure 5, 53. To provide a secure check of the propeller, gearbox, engine, and engine attachment to the carriage. Fuel System 1. Inspect fuel tank attachment and condition. 2. Inspect fuel vent system and ensure the fuel supply line is open. Some WSC aircraft have fuel shutoff valves outside the fuel tank. 3. Inspect fuel pickup and fuel line running up to fuel filter. 
while inspecting all fuel lines, jiggle all fittings and connections to ensure they are secure. 4. Inspect fuel filter and continue to follow fuel line up to fuel pump. 5. Inspect the security and condition of fuel pump. 6. Inspect fuel lines up to carburetors. Figure 5, 54. Induction system. 1. Inspect carburetors, including float bowl attachment and rubber bushing from carburetors into engine. 2. Inspect fuel lines from float bowls to carburetor inlet. 3. Inspect air inlet filter to ensure it is clean and secure. Figure 5, 55. End of page 5 to 19. Ignition system. 1. Inspect ignition system wires to spark plugs. 2. Inspect spark plug caps and wires to CDI units to ensure they are secure and fastened. Figure 5, 56. 3. Ensure ignition switches are turned off. Cooling systems. Ensure there is clear airflow for any cooling system fan or radiator. Ensure no insects or birds created an obstruction to the airflow for the engine cooling system. Air cooled, rotate the propeller and ensure that the cooling fan rotates also. Water cooled, check the coolant level to ensure there is cooling fluid in the system. For stroke with additional oil coolers, ensure the oil cooler has clear airflow and that nothing is blocking it. Exhaust systems. Inspect exhaust attachment to engine and EGT senders. Slightly jiggle the exhaust system to inspect the springs holding it together. All springs must be secure. Inspect the condition of exhaust system for cracks and attachment security. Figure 5, 57. Propeller gear box. Rotate the propeller in the proper direction only and inspect blades for cracks or nicks. Listen and feel for smooth operation and engine compression while rotating the propeller. Inspect propeller attachment to the gearbox and the gearbox attachment to the engine. Throttle system. Check all throttle controls for smooth operation and proper travel and locking. Also check choke and or primer system for proper operation and travel. Flight Deck Inspection The following should be performed for a flight deck inspection. 1. Check seat security and proper adjustment for pilot and passenger. 2. Check seat belt attachment and seat belt operation. 3. Inspect the gauges for security and readability. 4. A switch electrical master on and check gauges for expected readings. Figure 5, 58. 5. Check ballistic parachute handle for security and proper location. Fuel. Overall, particular attention should be paid to the fuel quantity, type slash grade, and quality. Modern WSC2 and four-stroke engines are designed to use autogas with various octane ratings as specified by the manufacturer for different models. If autogas is stored for more than three weeks, octane value may fall below the recommended rating. In this situation, it is best to drain the gas and use fresh gas. For engines designed for autogas, aviation gasoline, avgas, 100LL can be mixed and used on a limited basis but the lead in this is not good for the engine and additional precautions slash procedures should be researched for the particular make slash model of engine for primary use. End of page 5 to 20. Always use a higher grade slash octane of fuel rather than a lower grade, or detonation will severely damage the engine in a very short period of time. Check the aircraft operation manual and the engine manual for the type of fuel to use. When attempting to fuel for maximum capacity, remember that many fuel tanks are very sensitive to attitude. Fill the aircraft on a level surface and check to ensure the amount of fuel in the tanks is adequate for the planned flight plus 30 minutes of reserve. Check the level in the fuel tank plus the panel-mounted gauge, if so equipped. To transport gasoline, clear gas cans are preferable because the fuel is visible through the container and allows a pilot to look at the container for fuel level. Figure 5, 59. An important step in any pre-flight is to check for water and other sediment contamination. 
Avgas is more probable to have water in the fuel tanks because autogas typically has alcohol in it to boost the octane. Alcohol absorbs water, running it harmlessly through the system. When using 100 ll Avgas, water tends to accumulate in fuel tanks from condensation, particularly in partially filled tanks. Because water is heavier than fuel, it tends to collect in the low points of the fuel system. If Avgas is used, drain any water from the low point in the system. Oil A four-stroke engine's oil level should be checked during each preflight and rechecked with each refueling. For stroke engines can be expected to consume a small amount of oil during normal operation. If consumption grows or suddenly changes, qualified maintenance personnel should investigate. If the Rotax 912 oil level is low when the oil is checked, rotate the propeller in the correct direction, counterclockwise, facing it, to pump any oil from the engine back into the oil tank for a proper measurement and recheck oil level before adding oil. Figure 5, 60. Check the reservoir level of two-stroke engines with oil injection at each gas fill-up. It is also very important to ensure the oil reservoir has clear air vent holes to allow continuous flow of oil to lubricate the engine. Always use the same type of oil because different types of oil harden and stop the oil injection process, resulting in a seized engine. Additionally, check to see if the oil injection system lines from the tank to the carburetors are clean and secure. End of page 5 to 21. Some two-stroke engines have a separate lubrication system for the inlet rotary valve, this system should be checked for proper level and leaks. Figure 5, 61. When adding fuel and oil, ensure that the caps has been securely replaced. Ready aircraft to enter flight deck. Either before or after the routine pre-flight inspection, the aircraft should be unsecured, positioned for starting, and ready to enter the flight deck. A checklist provides the basic steps. 1. Untie aircraft, secure tie-down ropes in aircraft, or coil neatly if they stay at airport. 2. Remove ground chocks and secure in aircraft. 3. Locate a suitable area to start engine that is free of dirt and has minimal dust, preferably a paved or grassy area away from people and objects. 4. Position aircraft so prop blast is clear, verify that brakes are on, throttle is closed, and propeller area is cleared. 5. Position into wind, if possible, for best cooling during warm-up. Occupant Pre-Flight Brief A pre-flight briefing is required to ensure the passenger is informed on the proper use of safety equipment and exit information. This can be done before entering the aircraft and must be accomplished before starting the engine. Manufacturers of SLSA aircraft typically have printed briefing cards that should be used. The following is a comprehensive checklist that can be used as a guideline for any pre-flight briefing. 1. Seatbelt Fasten and Unfasten Procedures Seatbelts must be worn for takeoff and landing, and should always be worn during flight. 2. What passengers can hold on to and what not to touch. 3. Positive exchange of controls using a three-step process, you take the controls, I have the controls, you have the controls. 4. Look for other ground and air traffic. 5. Flight deck entrance and exit procedures including emergency exit. 6. Ballistic parachute operation procedures. 7. Engine out situation and procedures for planned flight with diversions. 8. Hand signals in case electric loads must be shut off or internal aircraft communications not functioning. 9. Water landings with engine out situation if planned flight over water. 10. Ensure nothing can fall out of pockets while in flight. This is especially important since the propeller is in back. 11. Helmet fastening and unfastening procedure. Figure 5, 62. 12. Review the type of aircraft, special or experimental, which is not an FAA certified standard category aircraft. 13. Fire extinguisher operation, if so equipped. 14. All safety systems, as required. 15. Use restroom before entering aircraft. End of page 5 to 22. 
Flight Deck Management After entering the flight deck, the pilot should first ensure that all necessary equipment, documents, checklists, and navigation charts appropriate for the flight are on board. Figure 5, 63 If a portable intercom, headsets, or a handheld global positioning system, GPS, is used, the pilot is responsible for ensuring that the routing of wires and cables does not interfere with the motion or the operation of any control. Regardless of what materials are to be used, they should be neatly arranged and organized in a manner that makes them readily available. The flight deck should be checked for articles that might be tossed about if turbulence is encountered, and any loose items properly secured. When the pilot is comfortably seated, the safety belt and shoulder harness, if installed, should be fastened and adjusted to a comfortably snug fit. The safety belt must be worn at all times the pilot is seated at the controls. Checklist after entering flight deck 1. Seats adjusted for full operation of all controls. 2. Seats locked into position. 3. Put on seat belts, lap first, then shoulder, and adjust so all controls and systems can be fully operated. 4. Check all control systems for proper operation. 5. Check all systems operations. 6. Demonstrate and practice flight and emergency equipment and procedures. 7. Demonstrate and practice what passengers can hold on to and what not to touch. 8. Demonstrate and practice positive exchange of controls. 9. Remove safety pin for ballistic shoot operation. 10. Install helmet, if applicable, and headphones. 11. Check intercom and radio communication systems. 12. Install eye protection, safety glasses, helmet shields. It is important that a pilot operates an aircraft safely on the ground. This includes being familiar with standard hand signals that are used universally for ground operations. Figure 5, 64. Engine start. The specific procedures for engines start very greatly since there are as many different methods as there are engines, fuel systems, and starting conditions. The engine start checklist procedures in the POH should be followed. The following are some basic steps that apply to most aircraft. 1. Key in, ignition on, master power on. 2. Check gauges for operation and fuel level. 3. Fuel pump on, or pump fuel bulb to fill carburetor bowls. 4. System switches on. Some WSC have specific system switches turned on after the engine is started because engine starting may create lower voltage possibly damaging instruments or systems. If in doubt, start engine and then turn on instruments and systems not needed for starting. 5. Both ignition system switches on. 6. Choke slash enrichener on, or pump primer as appropriate. 7. Throttle closed. 8. Brakes on. 9. Ensure propeller area is cleared, loudly announce to propeller area clear prop, and wait for any response. 10. Start engine through pull cord start or electric start, do not try to hand prop under any circumstances. 11. Ensure the aircraft does not move keeping hands on ignition switches for quick shutdown, if necessary. 12. Adjust throttle, choke or enrichener to keep engine running smoothly. End of page 5 to 23. 13. Turn on electric instruments if applicable. 14. Check gauges for proper ranges, oil pressure, revolutions per minute, RPM, charging voltage, engine temperatures within ranges, etc. 15. Continue to monitor area and shut down engine if any person or animal approaches. A relatively low RPM setting is recommended immediately following engine start. This is typically a slight increase in the throttle to keep the engine running smoothly. It is not recommended to allow the RPM to race immediately after a start with a cold engine, as there is insufficient lubrication until the oil pressure rises on four-stroke engines and unequal heating on two-stroke engines. In freezing temperatures, the engine is also exposed to potential mechanical distress until it warms and normal internal operating clearances are reached. 
On four-stroke engines, as soon as the engine is started, the oil pressure should be checked. If it does not rise to the manufacturer's specified value, the engine may not be receiving proper lubrication and should be shut down immediately to prevent serious damage. Taxiing Since an aircraft is moved under its own power between the startup area and the runway, the pilot must thoroughly understand and be proficient in taxi procedures. When the brakes are first released and the aircraft starts to roll, the brakes should be tested immediately for proper operation. Applying power to start the WSC aircraft moving forward slowly, then retarding the throttle and simultaneously applying pressure smoothly on the brake may be needed to accomplish this. If braking action is unsatisfactory, the engine should be shut down immediately. When yellow taxiway centerline stripes are provided, they should be followed unless it becomes necessary to deviate to clear aircraft or obstructions. Figure 5, 65 An awareness of other aircraft that are taking off, landing, or taxiing, and consideration for the right-of-way of others is essential to safety. When taxiing, the pilot's eyes should be looking outside the aircraft, to the sides, as well as the front. The pilot must be aware of the entire area around the aircraft to ensure that it clears all obstructions, people, animals, and other aircraft. If at any time there is doubt about the clearance from an object, the pilot should stop the aircraft and check the clearance. End of page 5 to 24. The WSC aircraft does have the advantage of the wingtip capability of being raised and lowered to clear objects. It is difficult to set any rule for a single, safe taxiing speed. What is reasonable and prudent under some conditions may be hazardous under others. The primary requirements for safe taxiing are positive control, the ability to recognize potential hazards in time to avoid them, and the ability to stop or turn where and when desired without undue reliance on the brakes. Pilots should proceed at a cautious speed on congested or busy ramps. Normally, the speed should be at the rate at which movement of the aircraft is dependent on the throttle. That is, the speed should be low enough that when the throttle is closed, the aircraft can be stopped promptly. A GPS provides this speed since the airspeed indicator is not effective at these lower speeds. A rule of thumb is 5 miles per hour, brisk walking speed, or 10 miles per hour for long unobstructed areas. When taxiing, it is best to slow down before attempting a turn. WSC aircraft taxi with the wing typically held in a neutral position, but stronger winds may require positioning of the wing so it cannot be lifted. Position controls properly for wind conditions. 1. Strong tailwind, pitch control normal or slight nose up with wings level. 2. Strong headwind, pitch control nose down with wings level. 3. Strong quartering tailwind, nose normal with upwind wings slightly down so wind cannot catch it, but not too low to cause excess stress on carriage mast. 4. Strong quartering headwind, nose down with upwind wings slightly down so wind cannot catch it, but not low enough to cause excess stress on carriage mast. Checklist for taxi plan taxi path to runway to avoid paths that would put the aircraft behind any propeller or jet blast. Observe other aircraft closely which could start up and taxi in front, if practical. 1. Turn on strobe light, if applicable. 2. Release brake. 3. When first rolling, immediately check brakes, steering, and shut down if either is not functioning properly. 4. Observe proper right-of-way while taxiing. Taxiing aircraft yield to landing aircraft, so landing craft have right-of-way over taxiing aircraft. Two aircraft approaching head-on will turn right, similar to what is done in a car. Two aircraft traveling in same direction, the forward aircraft has right-of-way because its pilot cannot normally see the aircraft in back. With two airplanes converging, the pilot who sees an aircraft on the right must avoid that aircraft. The aircraft on the right has the right of way. 5. Runway incursions, observe all taxiway and runway markings. Runway incursions are a significant risk and must be avoided. This is a most important concept. Taxi slowly and observe the basic airport markings slash signs. Clearance to proceed must be obtained prior to taxiing across any runway or entering a runway to take off. There could be large aircraft, which may not be able to respond to WSC aircraft quick movements. An important runway marker is the hold short line. 
Always stop before reaching this line and get clearance before crossing it. Figure 5, 66. 1. At a towered airport, this is clearance from the tower. Always read back tower instructions clearance when received from tower before proceeding. 2. At a non-towered airport, the clearance procedure is to listen to and monitor all air traffic on the airport radio frequency. Observe all air traffic taxiing and in the pattern. After listening on the radio and observing all possible traffic, announce position and intentions before crossing runway or entering runway. If crossing runway, announce once you have taxied across that you are clear of runway. End of page 5 to 25. Before takeoff check. The before takeoff check is the systematic procedure for making a check of the engine, controls, systems, instruments, and avionics prior to flight. Normally, it is performed after taxiing to a position near the takeoff end of the runway. Taxiing to that position usually allows sufficient time for the engine to warm up to at least minimum operating temperatures. This ensures adequate lubrication and internal engine clearances before being operated at high power settings. Many engines require that the oil temperature or engine temperature reach a minimum value, as stated in the AFM-POH, before high power is applied. Some WSC aircraft are ram air-cooled, where the cooling air must be rammed into the cooling radiator during flight. On the ground, however, little or no air is forced through the radiator. Prolonged ground operations may cause engine overheating. Some designs place the cooling radiators near the propeller so the propeller produces reasonable airflow to cool the engine. Air-cooled two-stroke engine aircraft may have an integral engine-driven cooling fan and can idle indefinitely without overheating. Monitoring engine temperature to be within limits is important for aircraft operations on the ground. After taxiing to the runway entrance run-up area and before beginning the pre-takeoff check, the aircraft should be positioned clear of other aircraft. When you taxi out to the run-up area, position yourself where other aircraft can easily taxi to a suitable run-up area. There should not be anything behind the aircraft that might be damaged by the prop blast. To minimize overheating during engine run-up, it is recommended that the aircraft be headed as nearly as possible into the wind. After an aircraft is properly positioned for the run-up, the nose wheel should be pointed straight. During the engine run-up, the surface under the WSC aircraft should be FIRM, a smooth, paved, or turf surface, if possible, and free of debris. Otherwise, the propeller may pick up pebbles, dirt, or other loose objects and hurl them backward or into the sail. Figure 5, 67. While performing the engine run-up, the pilot must divide attention inside to look at the instruments and outside the aircraft to look for other traffic. If the parking brake slips, or if application of the brakes is inadequate for the amount of power applied, the aircraft could move forward unnoticed if attention is fixed only inside the aircraft. Each aircraft has different features and equipment, and the before takeoff checklist provided by the WSC manufacturer should be used to perform the run up. Here is a general checklist 1. Verify the strobe light is on, if applicable. 2. Trim is set to proper speed for takeoff. 3. Brakes are set. 4. Ignition check always divide attention into and out of the flight deck in case the brakes cannot hold the aircraft still at the higher power settings. Some ignition checks are done at idle, see POH for engine specifics. If the brakes start to slip and the aircraft starts moving, decrease power immediately and re-evaluate how to run up and keep the aircraft stationary during run up. Run-up engine to consist an RPM higher than idle. Switch from both ignition systems to one and watch for a slight drop in RPM. Do the same for the other ignition system. 5. Verify engine temperatures, EGT, CHT, oil and or water, and oil pressure are within the acceptable ranges. At towered airports, obtain clearance from tower when ready for takeoff. At non-towered airports, when all air traffic is clear from observations and radio communications and while holding short before the runway boundary, hold short, line, announce the aircraft is entering the runway. This is a pilot's clearance at a self-announced airport to enter the runway. At all airports, do a visual verification that there are no aircraft landing before entering the runway. After landing. 
During the after landing roll, the WSC aircraft should be gradually slowed to normal taxi speed before turning off the landing runway. Any significant degree of turn at faster speeds could result in the WSC aircraft tipping over and subsequent damage. Figure 5, 68. End of page 5 to 26. To give full attention to controlling the WSC aircraft during the landing roll, the after landing check should be performed only after the aircraft is brought to a complete stop clear of the active runway. Post flight, parking, and securing. A flight is never complete until the engine is shut down and the WSC aircraft is secured. A pilot should consider this an essential part of any flight. Unless parking in a designated, supervised area, the pilot should select a location which prevents propeller or jet blast of other airplanes from striking the WSC aircraft. The pilot should always use the procedures in the manufacturer's checklist for shutting down the engine and securing the airplane. Some of the important items include 1. Set the parking brakes on 2. Set throttle to idle and let engine cool down to manufacturer's specifications 3. Turn ignition switch off 4. Turn electrical units and radios off 5. Turn master electrical switch to off After engine shutdown and exiting the aircraft, the pilot should accomplish a post-flight inspection. When the flight is complete, the aircraft should be hangered or tied down appropriately for the situation. There are a number of ways to park and secure the WSC aircraft depending on the situation. With normal aircraft tie-downs, little to no wind, and a short time frame for unsupervised parking, the WSC aircraft can be secured by tying both leading-edge crossbar junctions to the typical airport wing ties. The control bar is secured to the front tube with a bungee cord to stabilize the nose or the control bar can be pulled back and attached to the seat rail to keep the nose down in case of a possible headwind. Figure 5, 69. If higher winds are present, the WSC aircraft can be positioned so the wind is blowing from the side and the wing tip is lowered on the windward side so the wind is pushing down on the wing. This can be used to exit the aircraft and tie the wing down in higher winds. Figures 5, 70 through 5 to 72. End of page 5 to 27. For overnight or higher wind tie down, the complete wing can be lowered to the ground with a four point tie down. Each wing at the crossbar slash leading edge junction plus the nose and rear of the keel can be tied down for greater resistance to wind. For human or dusty areas, a cover is recommended for the carriage to cover the engine and flight deck. Figure 5, 73. The best way to secure the WSC aircraft for overnight is to put it in a hangar. If it must be stored outside, remove the wing and fold it up so there is no chance of the wing being damaged in an unforeseen gust front. Chapter Summary Pre-flight preparation should include the overall evaluation of the 1. Pilot, experience, sleep, food and water, drugs or medications, stress, illness and overall aeromedical factors, as discussed in Chapter 1, Introduction to Weight Shift Control. 2. Aircraft, proper transport, fuel, weight, does not exceed maximum, aero, takeoff and landing requirements, equipment. 3. Environment, where to fly, weather conditions, forecast for departure and destination airfields, route of flight, and specific airport patterns slash runway lengths. Pilot capabilities must be compared to the weather limitations for the decision of whether to go to the airfield. 4. External pressures, schedules, available alternatives, purpose of flight. Pre-flight procedures include 1. Setup of the wing and mounting the wing on the carriage, if trailered or taken down. 2. Tuning the wing to fly straight and at the proper trim speed. 3. Pre-flight inspection with written checklist of wing, carriage, power plant, systems, and flight deck. 4. Readying aircraft to enter by proper positioning and occupant pre-flight brief. 5. Engine start, taxi, and performing before takeoff check. Post-flight procedures include 6. Taxi off runway to appropriate location 7. Park, exit, post-flight and documenting any discrepancies 8. Hangar, secure or take down 
End of page 5 to 28. End of chapter 5. Please like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Thank you. Chapter 6 is coming soon. Thank <laughs> you.